hammers up. This is modern day auctioneering, online bidding. It's online first time, second time, third and final time. Hello everyone and welcome to the Micro Automotive Auctions podcast. Automotive Auctions, as you know, we are... Uh, looking to sell anything if you've got a classic car a supercar a sports car a motorbike even a motorhome then get in touch with us Uh, get in touch with us today and we'll get your vehicle or your item sold uh, next week Uh, this week i'm absolutely delighted it's going to be a really good podcast because we're talking all things sort of air cooled or air cooled up until a period and then more cooled after that uh, Nick and Phil was in with a little bit of air called and oil called uh, in a minute. Uh, but I'm delighted to be joined by my wingman, Mr. Nick Wow. Hi, everybody. How you doing? Very good, Nick. Not bad good. at all. And our guest this week, Nick, yes. wishes he lived in flat number six, I'm sure. Flat number six? That would be appropriate. If you lived in flat six with yeah, your that obsession, would that, would be, that would do it, <laughs> wouldn't it? <laughs> you might move to move to a flat six. It's none other than Frank Cassidy uh, from Boxing Gassy. Boxing Gasser, even. Or Boxing Gassy, Boxing Gasser. We we just had this conversation, <laughs> yeah. and we're still struggling to work out what it is. is it, it is boxing... whatever you want it to be, honestly. Well, let's say Boxing Gasser. <laughs> yeah, sure. That sounds uh, good. So, for f- Frank, uh, for you, uh, for anyone out there who, who's going, who's Frank Cassidy? Just tell us who you are and what your business is. Oof. Um, well, apart from growing my whiskers. <laughs> uh, impressive uh, though they are. Yeah. Um, so so I'm, a, I'm a diehard Porsche enthusiast. Um, I've been around 911s for for a little while now. Um, before the frenzy kind of kicked off, um, I kind of broke my teeth on on 964s because they were the only 911 I could afford. You bought an old um, air cooled 911, or you bought a 964 because you couldn't afford a 996 or a 907. Um, so the first one I bought was for the pricey sum of I think it was eight thousand um, pounds. It was a bag of nails, to be fair. It blew blue smoke. Had uh, had a rip leather interior, um, but it was a 911, and uh, and that's all that really mattered to me. And eventually, the engine blew, blew up, and that's a whole different story. Um, but that kind of ignited the fire. Um, and then, fast forward uh, years of not working at all in the automotive industry, uh, retail, homeware, electronics, um, a lot of sofas, um, supplying online retailers and department stores. I then sold that business in 2015. Um, and wanted to do something I was really passionate about. I'm passionate about business, but I hadn't been pas- passionate about the, um, the subject matter. You're being, and, you're uh, being very modest, Frank, because you, you, sold, you sold that business very well. You were very successful, weren't you? Well, that's kind of you to say. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky that, uh, you know, that I had a, an amazing team and, and uh, that, that helped me build what was, uh, uh, I believe, a, a really good, strong business. Um, and, uh, and then eventually it got to a point where, you know, there was an offer on the table and, um, I decided it was time to, to call it a day really. Good for you. Yeah. 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 Thank you. So what is the business today? So what is the business today? So the business today is boxing gas. So I finished in 2015. I saw my business in 2015. Then I kind of milled around trying to figure out what I wanted to do next. I did a few different bits and pieces as well on the side, but nothing to, to really write home about. And then slowly and surely this, this idea um, for boxing gas started coming started coming together um, along the way over the years of of modifying my cars and and restoring cars and um, hanging out with other Porsche enthusiasts whether it was on the racetrack or uh, up Alpine passes or, or whatever um, I got to meet a plethora of really amazing individuals a lot of amazing people and I think oh, from what I was trying to achieve and what I believe we've achieved with boxing gas is a stage for all of that. For, for all of that to come together. So it's really, we're just, we're just a home, but it's the, oh, sorry, we're just a house, but it's the people that make it home. And so it's really about um, finding great um, Porsche-related or automotive-related businesses that want to be based at Box and Gas and also attracting a lot of enthusiasts. And we're just the, the stage, if you will, uh, or the meeting ground. Um, for this kind of uh, for, for 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 the Porsche community, the boxing gas is a physical facility. Yes, that's it. That you're encompassing other Porsche, uh, whether they're engineers, designers, fabricators, or just enthusiasts, to come and join that facility. That's it. You've articulated it a lot better than I have. Um, effectively, in in terms of in terms of facts and figures, it's a it's a 100 acre site. 
um, that's entirely dedicated to the Porsche brand. Um, within there, you have uh, a series of buildings which have been constructed 16,000 square feet so far, which house um, one of the longest standing independent Porsche specialists. So they handle the servicing and restoration work at Boxing Gas. Um, and then over the next few years, we've got another, what is it, 30,000 square feet coming, which will be um, hospitality based and more Porsche related services. Um, what do we use the 100 acre site that we've got? Um, we use it for events. So we've got um, our annual all court event, which um, I'm pleased to say is in, our, in its third year this year. Um, and we'll also be a venue for other people. So if a car club or someone wanted to do corporate hospitality on our ground, something automotive themed, then they're more than welcome to do it. Um, uh, so, yeah, we're also a venue for hire as well. Cool. So, um, I mean, you're obviously you know, ingrained with Porsche. That's your world. Uh, but so are you, Nick. I mean, me too. I can't stop buying the blooming things. Uh, but you too, Nick, you, you, literally as you left school, the only thing you wanted to do was to sell Porsches. That is true. Yeah. I went to see the uh, careers master at uh, Repton School and everybody was saying what they were going to do with their lives, um, which basically was go to various different universities and what have you and study specific subjects. And I went in and the guy said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm not going to go to university. And um, I'm my dream, my hope, my aspiration is to become a Porsche dealer, which it genuinely was. And um, it took me quite a while to get there. Um, I think I was 42 when I finally did become one. So uh, leaving school at 18, that's, that's a fair while. Yeah, but it? you did it. But I you? did it. Yeah, I did it. And I, and I got a second one as well. I got uh, two Porsche dealerships in that's the fantastic. end. So that was really special. But uh, just listening to Frank talk about his early car, the, the relevant bit perhaps to the passion is that when I left school at 18 and got my first job as a car salesman in Birmingham, I think I told you this before, mm. uh, the first car I bought was a really old, tatty, grotty, cheap, nasty 911, but it was a 911, which I think was £2,000, which of 1,800 of which I seem to remember was on finance, <laughs> 200 was a deposit. From a company called Club Autos in, in Spark Hill, which Spark Hill itself is not the most desirable area of Birmingham. <laughs> and Club Autos, you certainly wouldn't argue with anybody there uh, or take the car back with any kind of problem because you'd have probably had your legs removed. Um, is, that, is that Club Auto Sports? Is that the name? Well, I think it's evolved were, into that. But okay. in the early yeah, days... Yeah. They, was, they would have literally clubbed you. Yeah. <laughs> at Club Motors. I'm talking about 1982. Right, That's right. how yeah. far back I'm going. Yeah. 82, well, 83. We're yeah, the same Club Auto Sports been around since 1971, I think, or 72. There you go. Yeah, there you go, yeah. But they've been, they would have been around. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so we're all we're all Porsche um, maniacs, really, aren't we? Mm. What we get, let, let let's find out why, because this is a I get asked this all the time. I get asked, and I'm sure you do, and mm. I've not asked you before, Nick. Why? Why Porsche? What does what does it do that's different from a a Ferrari or a BMW or a I don't know, an Alpha. What's well, I, different I had, about it? I had every reason to be a BMW man, and I am a BMW man, if I'm honest, because my grandfather was a BMW dealer, my father was a BMW dealer, my brother is a BMW dealer, and I ended up also being a BMW dealer. But BMW was a business passion because it was clearly a brand from which, certainly in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, one could make a lot of money. But the Porsche thing was, was a heart thing, the port for me, it, you know, for me, the shape of the 911, um, 1965, it came out, I was two. So I suppose I must have become aware of it when I was about eight or nine or ten in reality. So early 70s. And um, it just, to me, personified what a car should be. And the noise and the smell and the look and the touch and the feel, it just became special. And, and watching them, you know, I first went to Le Mans in the late 70s. I was about 16, 17, and seeing them come down the Molson Strait, you know, the, the, the RSs and RSRs of that era, and then la more latterly the 935s of that era, they just lit up my imagination. And, and for me, that's what I wanted to be involved in. You know, it was, it was just a brand that was, their the model range was very narrow, but their focus was 100%. Was and um, the cars they created were very, very exciting. Well, that sums you up beautifully, Nick, and why you love 911s. What about you, Frank? Where did it come from? Um, everything Nick said and more. Um, I think I think my love of 911s came from came from my dad. Actually, my my um, we were very privileged that my mum, uh, sorry, that my dad could buy a, a 911 when I was a kid. Um, it was a 1983 Target, 
and um, and my mum drove it for a number of years as well. And I would pester her to take me to uh, kindergarten, pick me up from it um, in the car. And um, and this one time when I was leaving uh, kindergarten, um, I got into the car and we were driving away. And just as we were, um, my mum had to slam on the anchors because two guys in Manaclavas ran across the street, jumped the stick. They then sped off, and then I don't know what she was. Um, what was in her coffee that morning, but she decided to, to follow them because she thought that there was something clearly not quite right. Um, so then that basically a 15 minute, well, it felt like 15 minutes, it probably was about five. I mean, I was little at the time, but um, car chase kind of ensued um, while she was telling me to memorize the number plate while she was chasing the car. Eventually she got the number plate and the car got away and the next day the police showed up and it transpired that the car had been used in some kind of robbery and uh, they hadn't found the culprits, but the car was burnt to a crisp. But suffice to say that that experience was was very seminal for me, or 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 for want of a better word, um, or that experience was the was the thing, one of the things that started it. For me. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I mean, having your mum tear ass around after robbers, yeah, <laughs> with well, you it. in the passenger seat of a nine eleven would do it for anyone. Well, I think. it's the sound of that. You know, what's called? We talk about it. I mean, all air cool guys, all Porsche guys talk about it. But you know, the sound of the air cooled engine is is a very distinctive sound. And yeah, I think hearing that howling through the streets of uh, of London um, was uh, was was really evocative for me. So that was that was one of the things. Um, and there's the reality of actually owning the car. And, you know, I think a, a lot of cars are good at one thing. You get American cars are great at going in a straight line. Um, whereas, you know, I think Porsche is, is very, good at, uh, very good at everything. Um, they're, they're, they're incredibly reliable. They're actually really practical. You put the rear seats down and I can tell you, you can fit four and a half weeks worth of luggage and a dock. Um, <laughs> you know, I've done it. I've toured, I've toured Europe in, in those cars more miles than I could care to care to remember, to be honest, and and they are just reliable, capable of doing B roads, A roads, technical stuff, the 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 what's called the motorway stuff, and they're practical on top of it. So so really, I've I've tried other brands. I've you know I've tried to to stray away to say okay, well I've got to broaden my horizons, but actually I'm I'm I always find myself going back to Porsche. I've owned. Italian uh, V8 screaming cars, um, a 355, a couple of those. Uh, I've owned American muscle cars. But again, they just didn't tick every box, whereas the Porsche really, for me, ticks every box. And the beauty of it is it's such, as much as people say that actually, you know, it's, it's, it's an evolution and not a revolution in terms of their different models, I personally think that, there, that there's such huge differences between, let's say, a I don't know, a 69S, you know, a frantic, um, uh, very revy little thing, very lightweight, it's all very tactile, and an 80s 930 where, you know, it's all in boost and you're just, you're just feeding in the throttle just to get that boost, just to hold it there until you just make it outside of the apex and then you, 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 you slam on the accelerator. So the point is, is that there's, there's, there's a lot to the Porsche range and there's a lot to master and there's a lot to understand. And I'd rather do one thing very well than be the master of none. Um, so I've happened to have decided that Porsche is what works for me. Yeah. There is, there is, there Sorry, is that's one a bit o- long answer. It, it, it's a good answer. There is one other aspect which I'd like to just mention briefly, Mike, which is the people. 911. I was the just pe- about to say that. The people that 911s bring together are extraordinary. I, when I left school, my first job was uh, working for John Fitzpatrick mm-hmm. at John Fitzpatrick Motors in Shirley. John Fitzpatrick was a works Porsche driver at the time, driving for Dick Barber and in America and uh, driving at Le Mans and so forth. And through John, I, I had a very good intro into the Porsche world. And, um, you know, if I look back now, one of the things that the, that the Porsche brand uh, has done from the early days before being a dealer and during when I was a dealer and after, it's the people that I've met, the fantastic people. Yeah, I can, uh, having travelled around the world and been a part of the Porsche scene around the world, I can say, hand on heart, I've never met a bad Porsche person. Uh, they're always really nice people and always willing to talk Porsche and uh, and help you, be enthusiastic about helping you. Um, the one thing out there that I think is important for us as well, being that we're, you know, we're an automotive auctions business, um, the prices of Porsche have just gone sky high. They've gone crazy for the early air-cooled cars, uh, even for the the later special edition models, the prices have gone sky high. Can we put a finger or even a date on when that started to happen and and why it started to happen? 
Well, it's interesting because you say they've gone sky high, and I know what you mean. Currently, they are definitely uh, de rigueur. But, you know, when we started Silverstone Auctions in 2011, the, um, the Porsche brand was popular, it was in demand, and we watched values climb more or less consistently right up to 2015, four or five years. And then in about 2015 slash 2016, we equally saw them go down yeah. at a fairly rapid rate through 17, 18, and probably 19 as well. So, you know, it's not just been a bed of roses. Yeah. And one of the reasons for that is that um, when values of anything, doesn't whether it's cars or it doesn't matter what it is, you then sometimes attract investors who aren't real enthusiasts. Right. And I think that's what happened. You know, people were buying 911s that didn't even know... They didn't know why they were buying them. They were just, they were just, you know, an investment. Yeah, told to buy them. Yeah, and when you get that kind of thing, and you, and you get this overflow of demand, because they perceive that values are going to go up and it's a tax-free gain, you you kill the market. And I believe that's what happened to the Porsche brand. So as they went down in 16, 17, 18, you started to lose those people, and and from 18 and perhaps 19 was really the turning point. You got the enthusiast demand back, the genuine Porsche enthusiasts like ourselves and uh, our regular customers who love them, you know. And so the values have now uh, stabilized, which is important, but you get the, because it's the enthusiast buying them, you get the rarer and the more significant Porsches really going up in value because you've got the real enthusiast buying them, not the speculator. Well, I'm glad you said that because uh, recently at our sister company, Silverson Auctions, uh, we sold a, a 1972 911.4S, uh, and that car sold for a, a very healthy hundred was it hundred and twenty four thousand pounds? I mean, it's a, a huge amount of money, isn't it, for a, an early nineteen seventy two? That's the one with the oil cap on that that one model year when they had that oil cap on the side uh, that they deleted soon after. Um, I mean, that's the kind of market we're in, isn't it, at the moment? I can remember not too long ago being at uh, Barrett Jackson uh, car auctions and uh, walking off at the end of the day. And one of those was running through the block, and I'd already reviewed it through the day, and I thought it'd make $100,000. And uh, because it was the end of the day and I was walking off, the hammer went down at $55,000, and I didn't put my hand up for it, uh, which I regret to this day. But that's a, a good case in point. That's an early car that's made really strong money recently. It has. Uh, the biggest uh, thing that Silverstone Auctions has ever done with Porsche was the sale last August, um, in the Silverstone Classic sale, I think we had 38, a collection of 38 Porsches, uh, which we did extremely well with, you know, smashing through estimates and reserves and brilliant, really, really amazing. So, But they were purest Porsches. It was actually a collection from somebody who also used to be a Porsche dealer yep. who'd assembled a very special collection of rare, rare cars. So, yeah, we've been very involved as an auction company with the brand, and automotive auctions is an ideal platform for the later car yeah so you know from 2010 onwards really anything 2010 to 2021 the beauty of automotive auctions is that you could you don't need as long as you can say hand on heart that the car's got original panels and original paint yeah you don't need to see the car no 50 or 60 photographs is enough yeah and that's where automotive auctions work so well with the porsche brand the older classics from the 70s or even the 60s um i think personally you know, you've got to see them. I think to buy those kinds of cars off photographs and without seeing them does leave you a little bit at risk. Um, but for the later cars, I think Automotive Auctions is a perfect platform. Yeah, absolutely. The newer port. Absolutely. If you've got one, contact us today and uh, we'll get it sold for you next week. We'll list it and uh, we'll try and get you a customer uh, by next week. Um, there's a little question for you, uh, Frank, in terms of the modification world. Okay, so if you... If you cast your mind back to when kids were modifying their, you know, Escort Turbos and Citroen Saxos and everyone frowns upon it and it's a nasty thing to do and these loud, farty, noisy cars bouncing through our towns and streets. That sort of translated itself into the Porsche world quite well because Porsche is an easily modified car. And although I stand at some car shows and people say, oh, you've you've ruined your SE because you've I put throttle bodies on it and a... 964 plenum m and k exhaust system on it and made it uh, louder and shoutier i've done exactly what the kid in the citroen saxo done uh, but that's sort of been justified now with the likes of companies like singer that are doing that in a you know in an industrial scale and doing it as a as a very accomplished business 
Yeah. No, I think um, yeah, I think there's there's many points you you touched upon there. Um, I think for for me the um, I think cars are mass produced. They're 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 built and made in such a way to appeal to as big an audience as possible. Understandably, but the truth is, is we're all unique individuals with very unique requirements. Um, and I think that the appeal in modifying a car, um, and let alone a Porsche, is that it's 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 basically creating something that is a truest repre- representation of what driving and cars mean to me. Um, and that going through that process makes that car um, that car come alive. It, you you create a real bond with it. Um, you know. Uh, Cars that are, I have low car, I have low mileage cars, which rare ones, um, but sit in the corner of the workshop um, with low mileage and gathering dust because, you know, they're, they're to, a, to a certain degree, they're undrivable. Um, and it's a good thing to have and it's a nice thing and I drive it very occasionally. But fundamentally, I think that when, and without wanting to get too philosoph- philosophical, but when the curtains finally close, all we're left with are our memories. And I don't want them to be of a car when that's what I love doing. Um, gathering dust in the corner of the workshop. I'd rather have a car that's high mileage, that's been to the moon and back, that I can build completely my own way, create lots of memories, creating something that I really believe in, um, and drive it endlessly over Alpine tours with friends and track days and experience what it means to be a, an enthusiast driver. And I think, um, I think, you know, Porsche is a brand that, for some reason, um, it's less frowned upon to modify than others. Um, people like to use them, like to drive them because they're so usable and so drivable. Um, and as a result, they want to make their tweaks and modifications. And I think in terms of values, I think if you're, if you're, if you're considerate about the way in which you modify a car um, and you use the right people and you do your right research, because it's all about provenance, it's all about the, the right people to work on the car and the right product on the car, then, um, then I think that car will look after you. And I think you can... You can take the risk in, in, in going for something that is modified as long as you've done the, the legwork and done it the right way. It's the individuality, isn't it? Yeah. That's, that's what yeah. it gives you. I'm fascinated to know one thing, Frank, and you can help me with this a little bit, is, is the 356 uh, recently has taken a trend with these outlaws and things of this nature, which are basically, as I understand it, modified. What, where's, well, how did that start and what's that all about? So, so that, so I grew up, sorry, I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent, but I grew up um, with Volkswagen magazines. I saw Herbie as a kid. My mum bought it for me as on a cassette. It's the love bug. Um, and uh, I fell in love with that, that little bug. Um, and so I would get as many models as I could. I could get as many magazines. And, um, and reading magazines, I discovered about the SoCal guys. And so these were a group of laid back surfer types in California that, um, decided they didn't want to spend money on big American V8s to go drag racing. They'd rather take, you know, this little unassuming bug for some reason or another, because it's to a degree, it's kind of illogical. Um, strip it down from, or strip it down of as, as much weight as possible. Strip off as much weight as possible, and tune the engines. And they went drag racing, and that that evolved into what they called the SoCal look. And it was this this fraternity that was really about that that passion for losing weight and winning drag racing. And I think that, you know, it's no, it's no secret that a lot of the Porsche guys come from a Volkswagen background. Um, and so, so eventually that, you know, permu- that permeates, yeah. um, you know, into, um, into 356s and into 911s and away you go. And I think one of the, 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 the oldest hot rodders out there when it comes to 356s was Rod Emery and his dad, or was his dad actually. And, um, and I think he is, he's, it, it, they, at the time, they, those outlawed, you know, those stripped out 356s um, weren't, um, weren't uh, accepted as proper Porsches. So they were called outlaw Porsches. And that's where, that's where it all began. Right. Interesting. Mm. Interesting. It's definitely a trend now that's, that's completely cool and, yeah. and hip, isn't it? It is, yeah. And having lived in California for the last six years, I know Rod and I got to meet him and, yeah. uh, and I've seen plenty of, I mean, every car show you go to, there's a, a whole section of outlawed 356s mm. uh, sitting there. And uh, they do have, I think, uh, a lot of style to themselves, as in they kind of, you know, no disrespect to the purists out there, they kind of look better. You know, once you start lowering them ever so slightly, black wheels, bring the wheels in, board a little bit, uh, two pipes out the back, uh, strip it out, little roll cage inside, nice little 
um, Alcantara or in corduroy uh, bucket seats in the car from a nine to period correct uh, seats. They start to take on their own little identity. And I, I once you debumper one of those three five sixes, they look better anyway. They really do. Uh, I bought a three five six when I was there with the specific. Uh, in my mind, I was going to outlaw it. I even went to a car show as my first bit of outlawing and bought myself two leather straps because I was going to leather strap the bonnet. Um, but then somebody offered me a handsome sum for it, and I thought I'd sell it instead. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. Very good. Um, so, you can take them out the dealer to yeah, California, ex- but you can't take the dealer at the moment. Exactly yeah. that. <laughs> exactly that. Then. So, um, uh, but what do you think of Singer? I, I think it's great. I think um, you know what? I think I think we live in a world where everybody's got to have an opinion on everything. Um, and fundamentally, I'm a very firm believer of you do you and I'll do me. Um, and people say to me, you know, what's called, should I modify a car? Should I not modify my car? And I say, it's your car, it's your rules. You do what you want to do. At the end of the day, like, who the hell am I to tell you what you want to do with your hard hand? Um, You know, the, the only advice I can give to someone, you know, who's, who's modifying a car is maybe get a 911, you know, what's called, a, if you're going to start with an old air 911, get it and enjoy it for about a year to figure out all the things which are wrong with it, because inevitably there'll be things that need to be readdressed. Spend your money getting those sorted so you have a good baseline. And that will give you, crucially, the time that it takes to figure out how you're going to use the car. Too many times I see projects, pro, sorry, projects um, get going where the, the, the vision isn't clearly defined and it ends up being a master of none. Um, so I think it's important to get to know a car, really understand it, really figure out what it is you want to do with it, how you want to use it, and then you can slowly make an action plan. Um, yeah. Sorry, that wasn't exactly an answer to no, your question. No, I thought it was fantastic. <laughs> as, listen, as long as there's people like you in the world, me and Nick have always got a job, and that's uh, <laughs> that is, that's the absolute truth uh-huh. of it. Uh, so tell us about the uh, the event. 21st of August, uh, tickets, where can we buy them? Can people come along? Is yeah. it open to everyone, <laughs> mm-hmm. or have you got to have a Stuttgart badge on front? I'm going to say this as well. One of the one things that I do love about the uh, Porsche community, no doubt you're going to pick up on this, is it doesn't matter whether you're going to put yourself a, a four-grand Porsche Boxster or you've gone and got yourself a Carrera GT, as long as you pull together in the same spot, you'll get the same amount of respect from that, that Porsche world. I absolutely agree with you. I think, you know, going back to that question you asked earlier, what is it about Porsche? It's about the people, and it's a very, very wide demographic. It's, a very, um, it's very much an equalizer. It's not an exclusive brand, but it doesn't work with snobbery, I don't think. I think people which are like that get ousted very quickly from the community. I think that what's called, because you can get like a three-grand Boxster and a multi-million pound collector 73 RSR, for example, you get um, just a very wide demographic. Um, and I think that's very cool. We just happen to be focusing on the air cool stuff at the moment because that just happens to be what I really enjoy. Um, but uh, that suffice to say that, you know, to, and, and to answer some of your questions, um, the event is open to everyone. Um, you know, a lot of the water cool guys are very much into the air cool stuff. A lot of the air cool guys are very much into the water cool stuff. So we get, so we have a lot of water cool tickets available for, for, for the water cool Porsches. And actually, the first year, I, 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 I mistakenly thought that the event wouldn't necessarily be appealing to people who don't own Porsches, um, and I didn't offer enough tickets. And so um, the subsequent years, and this year included, um, I increased the amount of general admission non-Porsche tickets um, because I think it's important to share, share the passion with those that perhaps aren't even just quite there yet or even just have a passing interest in it. Um, so 21st of August? Yeah, so 21st of August. Tickets are available at oilcooled.com. Um, yeah, there's not much else to say. It's, it's basically a celebration of everything air-cooled. Um, there's, we, have a, we have a wonderful lake at our, uh, at our premises at Box and Gas. Um, it's a very rural kind of landscape, so we park the cars all around on the lawns of the place, and all the air-cooled cars that come in take part in the show. They are part of the event. Um, there's no VIP areas or exclusive areas. It's a very laid back, chilled affair, um, just to just catch up with friends. Again, we're just a platform. No VIP areas. That's counts. Me out. <laughs> when, uh, when Frank was yeah. describing it, I've been, you see, so, and I mm. appreciate you haven't, Mike. And when Frank was describing it, it, the hundred acres, it sounded like a sort of industrial estate. It's nothing like that. Yeah, yeah. It's a beautiful farm in Oxfordshire is what it is. That's with a, a lovely meandering drive down lakes, fields, green. And some lovely buildings around, which are gradually expanding in the area. So it is a, it is it is a beautiful setting. It's not a hard industrial setting at all. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. So you know what's called. I'm I'm not very good sometimes at answering the question of what boxing gas is because I, I live and breathe it so much, and I'm in it so much, and it's a, it's 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 an all-encompassing thing that takes that takes you know that that takes all of me. 
but sometimes it's a little bit hard to, as stupid as it sounds, to take a helicopter view and 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 um, and and be able to describe it articul- in an articulate way. When when, when Frank contacted me and said, um, you know, come on down because we're having a stand there, you know, uh, with automotive auctions. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And when he contacted me, we went down to meet. My expectation versus the reality was extraordinary. You know, that I was looking for the industrial estate and and the. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, auto farmer there and various other Porsche specialists. And I was looking for that kind of yeah. Yeah. typical garage environment. But no, 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 no. This is a beautiful a, farm. So, yeah, it's 100 acres of sprawling countryside, woodlands and lakes. Um, all the buildings are, all the buildings, I've you know, are, are, are a real passion project for me. Um, it's not just an industrial building that's gone up and there's nothing wrong with that. But I wanted to do something that was true to, to our setting and unique to us. Um, so, so all our buildings are, it's reclaimed brick and wood, uh, concrete floors, very industrial, very honest. I wanted to, you know, I think that Porsches are very honest. They, they look a certain way because they perform a certain way. And I wanted the buildings to look like that also. I wanted the buildings to reflect uh, a kind of a functional aspect of it. So all our conduit is exposed. Um, you know, all our, all our lighting, everything is exposed, basically, so, um, uh, so that it's, it's part of the character of the building. It's his own take on the Porsche corporate identity. You know, if you, you walk into a modern Porsche dealership, everything... Chrome. Well, every, everything chrome. in the entire dealership, from the mini, the, the doors, the handles, the desks, the lighting, the floor, it's all determined by Porsche. You have no choice as a dealer. You have to pay ridiculous prices to do it. I know I've done it twice. But Frank is doing his own version of that, you know, and, and, and it's not based on if you like, a, a, a uniform cost-based brand identity. It's based on char- charisma and feel and respect to the area as well as respect to the, to, to the Porsche brand and the people. It covers, That's very all, kind of it covers to say. all of it. Well, it's I can't wait to, to see it. And uh, Eva, Nick, I'm shotgun with you. You're shotgun with me. Yeah. Sounds like we mean you've got a date on the 21st of August. <laughs> I cannot wait for that. And uh, that, would, that, that would just be a, a spectacular day out uh, right in the middle of summer. Um, to, we got some questions from our audience, but you actually had a question about oil cool, didn't you, Nick, for Frank? Well, I was just, I was just trying to determine w- w- whether it's oil cooled or air cooled. We have during this conversation referred to both, and 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 uh, box and gasser. Does it literally translate, Frank? To one yeah, or so the other? so so box and gasser translates to pit box. It's an old, it's an old German word for pit box, which is uh, where the garages are in the pit lane. They are the garages in the pit lane. Um, so does that, is that that's where box box comes from on the Formula One and and motorists. yeah that's it that's yeah. exactly it okay. so like for 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 me again we're just a garage we're just you know the place where the industry professionals and the enthusiasts come together now we built that that place but fundamentally it's the people that make it so I thought boxing house was quite representative of that it also I you know what's called in terms of, of branding I'm 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 it's something I'm very passionate about um, and something that I enjoy and have a lot and I think that it's very important to choose a brand name. That the where the skies are the limit that it doesn't restrict you in in any kind of sense to a degree um, is as expansive as possible because too many times and I've it's happened to me on past businesses where I've gone down a specific road and it gets very expensive when you have got big brands to try and realign them and change the branding and 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 make them work within themselves so that was the that was the reason behind Box and Gaster and it took a lot of time to find the name but yeah that was it and then oil cooled um, well you know what's called a uh, Air cooled enthusiast or anoraks, I think will um, will ca- will call the air cooled cars either air cooled or oil cooled. Some will tell you that technically speaking, they are cooled by oil, um, so they are oil cooled. And then there's the other side of it, which again is a branding uh, side of it, which is that um, it was a uh, it was an it was an asset or a, or the intellectual property was available, um, so we snapped it. Yeah, so oil cooled is what it is. There you go. Right, so if you've got a question for us, remember you can reach us on social media, everywhere on social media, uh, Automotive Auctions UK or just Automotive Auctions, just Google it. Uh, or if you want to go to our website, you can even send us an email, automotiveauctions.co.uk. Uh, right, so we've got some questions come in. we got this one. It says this one's for Nick. Uh, somebody's got a 1993 Toyota Corolla. Uh, they would know what the selling price is for a 1.6 16-valve saloon car which is clean and fixed up. I mean, that's a bit of a long, uh, it's a bit of a tough one, isn't it? Because uh, it's a it's a 93 Toyota Corolla, the biggest selling car in the world yep. by a long way. It certainly I think was it, in 93. Yeah. It was, certainly was in 93. It's kind of a vanilla car, isn't it? Being a, just a 1.6, 16 can, valve. Can you know what? It doesn't matter what the car is. The way to value a car is very simple, really, which is to go onto a mass website like Autotrader 
to put in exactly the year, the mileage, and the spec that the car is, and it'll bring up every other similar car that's on the market if you tick the national box. And then you can see what they're making, and obviously you've got to price position your car to look tempting. Exactly. But so that's the, that's the easy, quick way. But uh, also, of course, you can contact our experts, which we'd be delighted to do. We've got three people sat waiting for your call uh, in, our, in our automotive auctions kiosk, no less, um, to, to help you with that process and to give you a valuation and, and also to, to recommend, uh, you know, uh, the price guide and all the rest of it and the, and, and the reserve and so forth. And remember, it's for free. You know, you sell for free. with all You don't models. have to pay anything. And, uh, and because your car is a 1.616 valve, I would say, uh, and I, uh, when I say a vanilla car, there's going to be loads of other cars out there that look exactly the same as yours for sale. So just try to make your one look ever so different by detailing it properly, cleaning it up properly, present the service history, anything you've got for the car, the toolbox, uh, the tool bag, whatever it is, the spare wheel, take pictures of that, put it all on display before you advertise it. Make your car stand out from the rest. And you should get it sold. Uh, another question on Instagram. This one uh, is from somebody who's looking for a right-hand drive. Nine, this would be a good question for you, Frank. Looks like <laughs> looking for a right-hand drive. Uh, 944. He lives in America. How hard would it be to import to the US after purchase? Hmm. I can probably help with that one as well. Yeah, I think from from an import uh, importing side of things, I, I'm I'm not familiar with with uh, with America, so I can't I couldn't tell you that. If, I, if you were asking me how to import a car in the UK, then I'd be able to tell you. But yeah. um, but that way around, I'm afraid it, it, I don't have the answer. It's very tough, actually. Mm. It depends what state they're in in America, because uh, each state has a different law, and it's very tough to import a car from Europe into America, especially California, because they have certain laws. It's got to be 25 years old. 944 it's likely to be 25 years or older so you can get it into the state of california uh, but you um, will have to pay tax on import when it comes in it's likely to cost you around two and a half thousand dollars so you can translate that to be about two thousand pounds to put it in a container to get it there then you've got to pay your tax on uh, the purchase price which in most states is around 10 percent of what you paid for the car so it's gonna be you know it's tough i would say you know being it's a a 944. I don't know why you want to write and drive one. Maybe you want to go uh, racing with it. But I would try my hardest to find that car in the States rather than go and try and find that car in a right and drive country. Definitely. I think, you know, what's called buying a, buying a classic car, you know, uh, it, take, it takes time to, to figure out just the right one and so on. And I think why make it harder on yourself if you can find something that's local, especially if it's not an incredibly rare car? Um, don't get me wrong, a 944 is an awesome car, a great car, beautifully balanced, a fantastic car, but it's not a rare car. So there's, I don't think, I don't think that, that someone should give themselves the headache for something like that. They should really look for something locally. And the last question is for you, Frank. Uh, this is somebody who's asking if you could pick your top three cars, uh, your top three favorite Porsches, what would they be? Hmm. So the temptation is to say... Um, three liter RSR. Yeah, the temptation <laughs> is to say a three liter RSR, and that, that is way up there. Um, but actually, you know, what's called... It goes back to what I was saying, and I don't want to sound like a cracked vinyl or, or crack record, but, um, you know, a high mileage car that's been to the moon and back, to me, it really excites me. I just think there's a blank canvas, can do what I want. You know, there's, there's no restraint. Um, there's that freedom of expression to build something that I really absolutely love. Um, but aside from that, yeah, a 3 liter 74 RSL would go down well, uh, probably a 917, uh, 904, 906, um, you know, the, yeah, the 962s, you know, uh, 934s. Frank, you have yeah. three to Sorry. choose from, right? <laughs> you have three. But there's just, there's just so much, and they, they all have such brilliant, unique, different characters, and I'm, I'm in a bit of a 934 kind of um, uh, air-cooled turbo phase at the moment, where... Um, I just, I don't know, there's, there's something about lag. You know, people talk about lag being bad, but actually I think lag is good. It requires you to focus and it makes driving so much more rewarding because of it. I can see that on a new boxing gas t-shirt coming soon. Lag is good. Yeah, lag is good. <laughs> lag good is idea. good. Yeah, yeah. It's a good idea for a t-shirt. Yeah, yeah. uh, if you've got a question for us, remember to reach us on all forms of social media. Just look us up. It's Automotive Auctions UK. Uh, thank you very much to, uh, for joining us, Frank. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you down here, uh, learning about your your really mad world of Porsche. We're so looking forward to your event, 21st of August, Box and Gas, uh, and it's in Oxfordshire. Uh, tickets are online. Yeah, no, thank you so much for having me today. Um, it's been a real pleasure, and I'm very honoured to be asked. 
um, and I'm very much looking forward to to hosting yourselves at uh, at Awkward this year. So yeah, thank you both, Nick and Mike. There's an invite. We'll, we'll be there. There will be a VIP area now, Nick. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to work out the record. Just going to work out which of my Porsches to take down and put on the stand. Oh. But, uh, <laughs> very very good. We're looking uh, forward to it. Uh, thank you very much to you, Nick, uh, for joining us Thanks again. Well. It's uh, it's an absolute pleasure doing this. Uh, don't forget automotive auctions if you've got a uh, supercar sports car if you've got a classic car motorbike moto or number plate you're looking to sell then please contact one of our team today we'll get it listed for you and we'll get it sold next week with no fees remember that no fees uh, thank you very much for joining us we'll see you all again soon tell up amazon this is modern day auctioneering online bidding it's online first time Second time, third and final time.